Greetings and welcome to the first lecture for the graduate course ECE 257A, uh, Fault Tolerant or Dependable Computing. I'm recording the lectures for this course because instruction during fall 2020 will be uh, conducted remotely. Uh, so there are no in-person classes. Um, however, these lectures I plan to use in future for the same course uh, in a model called uh, inverted classroom, meaning that students will uh, watch the lectures uh, before uh, the date of the class and then the class session when it's possible to hold it in person, will be devoted to discussions and questions. So this quarter, the normal class time, the, the first hour of the normal class time, uh, twice a week, uh, will be converted to Zoom office hours. Where you can basically ask any questions regarding uh, the lectures or any other matter related to the course. Um, also, to make this lecture independent of the current quarter, uh, I will not say anything about the specific requirements uh, of the course this quarter. Uh, instead, I will communicate uh, through, uh, that information uh, through the course webpage and also occasional email messages sent through Gaucho Space. So Gaucho Space, I will not use much except to send messages to uh, everyone enrolled in class. Uh, there are two, <coughs> excuse me, there are two web pages that you need to consult regularly in order to manage um, this course throughout uh, the quarter. One is the course web page, ECE 257A webpage. And the other one is the textbook webpage. I'm using my own textbook, which is in draft form, uh, available freely online. <clears throat> in order to get to these two web pages, all you need to do is to go to any of my ECE UCSB web pages. And no matter which page you end up on, so you can easily do that through Google search. There is a menu bar on the left side of the screen that has various sections. The two sections you want to look at are the teaching section, where the courses I teach are listed, including ECE 257A. If you click on the ECE 257A button in that menu, it will take you to the course or web page. And there you see the requirements for the course, a lecture by lecture schedule, meaning you know it's indicated what will be covered in each lecture in terms of chapters in the textbook, and a bunch of deadlines, including when homework will be posted. There will be four homework, uh, and when each one is due, uh, and uh, also the various deadlines associated with your research project. So there are two components to the course evaluation, four homework assignments, and a research paper and its presentation in the form of a poster. So as I said, all these details are given on the course website, and I'll communicate with you through email messages throughout the quarter to supply more details. But make sure you look at the course calendar on the course webpage and uh, sort of make a note of all the various deadlines. Uh, homework will be due on a certain date and no extension is possible for whatever reason because I want to provide uh, solutions to the homework on the due date uh, so that you, you can check your own work. And that, in part, is necessitated by the fact that I won't do detailed grading 
of the homework. I'll just assign A, B, C, D letter grade to each homework assignment based on an overall check uh, of the quality of work and also occasional checks of the details, but there will be there will not be detailed grading or feedback. Okay, so the solutions I provide are sort of uh, feedback because you will know whether you got the, the right answer, the right solution. On the course, on the textbook webpage, again, there's another section in that menu, uh, menu bar entitled textbooks where the textbooks that I've written appear. You want to look for the textbook on dependable computing. And you see on this slide uh, that is up now, the cover image of that textbook. This is a temporary cover that I've designed. It may change when the book is published. And on the textbook web page, uh, there are two things that you will get. One is uh, PDF copies of the various parts. Each of the seven parts in the textbook uh, is available as a PDF document that you can download. But before you download, make sure that the uh, last update uh, that you see there is 2020. Uh, because I'm updating as we go along the quarter these parts. So make sure you download the textbook uh, chapters or parts uh, after they've been updated for 2020. <clears throat> and you also have their copies of the slide that I use for my lectures. And these slides appear both in PowerPoint format and PDF, okay? Um, I don't use any animation in these slides, so the PDF is just as good as the PowerPoint. It's usually a smaller file and also uh, easier to navigate on different types of computers or even tablets. So I recommend that you use the PDF version of the slides. Okay. So let's get started with this introductory lecture that actually has two parts. Uh, there is, uh, towards the end of the lecture, I will discuss chapter one in the textbook. And in the beginning is what you may call chapter zero, some material that precede, uh, precede chapter one, just some generalities about the field of dependable computing and so on. And uh, the textbook has been written. And the normal expectation is that each chapter will be covered in one lecture. That, that's one of the design criteria for the textbook, uh, lecture size chapters. There are 28 chapters and there is an appendix that is almost like a chapter. And uh, there's simply not enough lectures in a 10 week quarter to sort of follow that recommendation of one lecture per chapter. So the way I do it during um, uh, a 10 week quarter at UCSB is that I will cover the first four chapters in four separate lectures because those are fundamental background materials, the tools that we need to be able to design and evaluate dependable systems. So the first four chapters will be four lectures. But after that, I will combine two chapters into one lecture. And uh, the way I do that is that each part, for example, this part labeled part two defects, this is the structure of the textbook, always has two chapters on methods associated with that part and two chapters containing examples of the use of those methods some of the most prominent examples. <clears throat> and the way I do it is that I will devote one lecture, for example, to chapter five, effect avoidance, combined with chapter seven, which discusses shielding and hardening of circuits, 
as methods of defect avoidance. So five and seven will be one lecture. Then defect circumvention, chapter six, will be combined with chapter eight, yield enhancement in integrated circuits through methods of defect circumvention. Okay, so this pattern will continue. Chapters 9 and 11, one lecture. Chapters 10 and 12, one lecture, and so on. So that's the plan. That, that's how we can reduce the number of lectures to about 16 or 17. And uh, of course, we need some other like some other time that there will be a holiday and so on. Uh, normal quarters will have a midterm exam. So 16, 17 lectures is all we can you normally get during a quarter. Now, let me say a few words about this image or the two images on the cover of the textbook. Uh, they are important ideas related to dependable computing. Uh, the chain here with one of the links nearly broken and coming off is intended to, <clears throat> oh, let me advance the slide. Is intended to convey the fact that dependability is a, is a weakest link attribute of a system, a weakest link phenomenon, meaning that this chain is as strong as its weakest link. The same applies to dependability. If you design a computer system uh, with various parts, a CPU, some memory, some bus system to connect them, uh, some external interface to the network, and so on. And if all of these various subsystems are needed for the system to function properly, the weakest of those in terms of dependability dictates how dependable the system is. So you want to invest uh, your money and time in improving that weakest link in order to improve overall system dependability. Uh, the second part of this image represents two key ideas in designing dependable systems. <clears throat> and those two key ideas are modularity and redundancy. <clears throat> modularity means the system is designed in modules, and these modules are hopefully isolated from each other. So if something goes wrong within one module, it is not spread, the problem is not spread, and infect the other modules. This is important because then any problem or failure can be confined to one part of the system and hopefully the other parts can uh, tolerate <clears throat> or proceed uh, to function as normal uh, despite one part of the system having failed. <clears throat> of course, the assumption is that failed part is not critical to the functioning of the system, and we can set it aside and ignore it. So that's the idea of modularity. And redundancy means the system has more resources than it absolutely needs. So if part of the uh, set of resources become unavailable, uh, the system can still function with reasonable performance and do at least do its critical task, if not all of the tasks that it was supposed to perform. <clears throat> and this example arises in, say, this is a typical cable that used uh, to hold up, say, suspension bridges. And you see that this cable is modular. There are multiple cables woven together to form this thicker cable. So if one of these cables fails, snaps, we still have plenty 
uh, for other cables that are functioning properly and hopefully there is enough redundancy here that we don't really need all of the seven cables to be fully functional at peak strength in order to hold up the bridge. Maybe only three of these cables are sufficient. And therefore, if some other cables snap, fail, or maybe they started with some defects. There are some defects inside these cables that we don't see, but make the cable less than full strength. These can be, for example, uh, if these are metal wires forming the cables, they can be air bubbles. Uh, in the metal, so that the metal is not really as strong as it looks from the outside. Okay, so uh, the name of this course is Fault Tolerant Computing Officially. Uh, this is a discipline that began in the 1960s. Uh, and the uh, US Space Agency, NASA, was one of the main driving forces uh, behind this field because they, they needed to put computers on spacecraft, uh, whether unmanned missions or manned missions, and these computers had to be highly reliable uh, because once the spacecraft leaves the Earth, uh, there is no maintenance crew that can visit the computer and take care of problems. And in some cases, these missions, space missions, were quite long, up to 10 years, say, and the computer had to survive for that period of time, for that 10 years without failing. So they needed highly reliable computers that um, level of reliability that was not available in normal computers that you can buy off the shelf. Therefore, they had to develop uh, special architectures and designs for the spacecraft computers. In the early 1980s, the name dependable computing was proposed for the field uh, because fault tolerant computing is really a bit restrictive. Again, as we will see in this course, I use fault in a specific technical, uh, technical sense. And although you know fault has been used to describe anything that can go wrong, I use it in a specific sense at the logic level, and I also use other terms such as defect at the physical level, error at the informational level, and so on, malfunction at the system level. So fault tolerant means those specific kinds of problems that we call fault in this course are tolerated. Well, there are other kinds of problems that we will see, so we need error tolerance we need defect tolerance, we need malfunction tolerance. So that's one sense in which fault tolerant is quite limited. And the second sense is that while well, tolerating faults is, is good, you know, but why don't we try to just avoid faults altogether? It's called fault prevention. So fault prevention techniques and then Correspondingly, error prevention, defect prevention, malfunction prevention uh, in our terminology. Those are also parts of uh, techniques that are used and available to designers of computers. So dependable computing avoids this problem. Basically, all the techniques that allow us to design computers to be dependable, more dependable than they normally would if we don't have any special provisions. The field of dependable computing has a flagship conference. It's called DSN, uh, International Conference on Dependable Systems and Networks. It has a long history, so this is the latest version of the name of the conference. <coughs> and it has a journal published by IEEE. IEEE Transaction on Dependable 
and secure systems. Of course, researchers in this field also publish in other conferences dealing with hardware design, software reliability, and so on. And they also publish in other journals. So, for example, IEEE Transactions on Computers occasionally has uh, dependable computing papers. These are the two main sources of information, places to start if you are trying to research some idea or technique, uh, DSN conference, and IEEE Transactions on Dependable and Secure Systems. Now here is something strange. Usually when one teaches a course, uh, he or she would say, well, this course is very important, is indispensable, and everybody should take it. Sort of try to sell the course as important. I'm arguing in this slide that this course should not be needed. In other words, it should really be removed from the curriculum. And here's my reasoning. Okay, I use this analogy. Uh, if you think about structural engineering, we don't teach people how to design bridges and then have a separate course that some people may not take. It may be an optional course in which we teach how to design bridges so that they don't collapse. Okay, that's insane. Part of the process of designing and building bridges is ensuring that they don't collapse. They're strong enough, they're reliable. They can do their function properly. Unfortunately, in computer engineering, that's not yet the case. We teach programming, often ignoring a lot of methods that we mentioned in this course to make programs more reliable less error prone. Things like bound checking, checkpointing, and so on. We'll see some examples of these in this course. In logic design, we often do not teach techniques of fault testing and self-checking design. These are techniques that we'll talk about in this course. So ideally, all these techniques should migrate, be merged into regular computer engineering courses so that we don't need to teach these techniques in a separate course at the graduate level that very few people will take. <coughs> <coughs> but now, given the current situation, we have no other option. But to proceed with this method. So I'll teach you a collection of techniques that you can apply to what you have learned in other courses in order to make whatever you're building or designing, whether it's a program, whether it's a parallel computer, whether it's a circuit, a logic circuit, to make it more dependable. We're using the older term uh, to make it fault tolerant. Okay, I'm gonna skip especially in today's lecture a lot of slides because I have quite a few of them and let you read them uh, that includes this slide uh, it uh, sort of in a few words describes each of the eight decades from the 1940s to the 2010s the decade that we just concluded uh, what happened in this field, what new ideas emerged, and so on. So it's a historical overview. And then a preview of the decade, 2020's decade, uh, depending uh, on your definition of a decade, sometimes 2020 is viewed as the last year of the previous decade or as the first year of the new decade, so it doesn't matter. Uh, what can we expect in the coming 10 years, let's say, in the field of dependable computing? Well, we still have a lot of ambitious big projects. 
we, we have a lot of work to do, so to speak. Ambitious projects include harsh environments. As we go deeper and deeper into space, the environment that uh, computers on board spacecraft or computers on board rovers that land on different planets, uh, they, they must endure harsher environments. Uh, there are a lot of life and death situations in which computers are involved, including in high-speed transportation, self-driving cars, and so on. So that's one set of challenges, these ambitious projects. Uh, the need for computers is expanding, and increasingly people who are not really trained in computing are using computers. Uh, smartphones everybody uses, no matter what they're training. So we have to make these systems more dependable and more easily usable for the increasing set of users that come in contact with them. And maintenance costs are increasing, continue to increase, and therefore the less maintenance these systems need, uh, the lower the overall cost. Uh, data is increasingly generated in digital format and kept in digital format. If we have a digital journal, technical journal, there's no no, no longer a fallback position where you can go into the, the library and check out the printed copies. Some journals don't even have printed copies anymore. And therefore, protecting data and ensuring uh, long lives for data files that we create is becoming increasingly important. And then the emphasis in design is also shifting. We no longer but uh, large teams of hardware software developers to build a dependable system. Hardware development, including uh, designing and building new chips, is now extremely expensive. We really can't afford to do that. So we take what is known as commercial off-the-shelf COTS hardware components, uh, CPUs, GPUs, memory chips, and so on, things that are built for general use. And then we somehow put these components together in a way that they behave more dependably. And the primary mechanism for doing that is to sort of uh, wrap that hardware in layers and layers of software to protect it against various external elements and influences. Of course, software itself is prone to failure, so it's a tricky situation to do this. But we, we have developed techniques to uh, develop software that is more reliable, and therefore we'll talk about some of those techniques. And of course, like everything else in today's society, uh, considerations of fairness, equity, and social justice are have been brought to the forefront. Uh, for example, you probably have heard about artificial intelligence being criticized for not being fair, for being biased, uh, and researchers are working to remove these problems, build artificial intelligence systems that do not exhibit any bias. And social justice, of course, especially in the United States, given recent uh, uh, developments, social developments, has become very important. How do we ensure that all these computer systems, whether particularly dependable or not, are applied in a way that it honors social justice and, in fact, helps us uh, create a socially just society. Okay, the next three slides are something I call a pretest. Um, I used to give 
this pretest in class and then have students uh, write their answers and then spend a few minutes go over the solutions and basically self grade their pretest to see how they did it wasn't part of the formal course requirement it's sort of something that gives you an idea about how prepared you are for this course and how much you really need this course <clears throat> And so these are four questions. The questions are mostly about probability. And that's a subject that you need to be comfortable with in this course. We refer to probabilistic notions uh, quite often in the course uh, because dependability, of course, is itself ensured in a probabilistic sense. You can't say a system is 100% dependable. There's no such thing as a perfectly dependable system. So we assign probabilities to the level of confidence that we have in the system being dependable. So these are some questions about probability, including question four, which is the famous Monty Hall problem. Make sure you read these and answer them and a lot of times you can find uh, answers on the internet to these problems uh, that you, you can check to see how you did. Now this one, question five, I put on a separate slide. Uh, it's a key uh, observation here that obviously you see from the photo that something has gone wrong here. This forklift and its load are not supposed to be there. But they are. Something happened. I want you to speculate, discuss, whether this mishap that you see in this photo was due to some design flaw in the forklift, some implementation bug. Maybe the design was okay, but it was implemented incorrectly. Procedural inadequacies in using how, how to use the forklift or human error. And of course, uh, I give you a spoiler. We really can't tell which one it is. So I want you to sort of do your best to guess, you know, what went wrong here. What happened? Why is it that the forklift is in the position it is? So there is no one correct answer, but basically discuss what's happening here. And here are five more questions. Uh, and at the end of the slide, you see if you had trouble with three or more questions, you really need this course. Okay, if you have any problems or you want to discuss any of these, you can do it during uh, our office hours, which uh, are basically the first hour of the two scheduled course ses session on Monday and Wednesday beginning at 10. So 10 to 11 Monday, Wednesday will be my Zoom office hours where I will provide you with a Zoom link through messages and then you can come discuss these with me if you want. Now this is a picture of a collapsed bridge from 2007. Uh, it was 13 years ago now, so I don't know how many of you remember this. Uh, it was a bridge. Uh, in Minneapolis over the Mississippi River that collapsed. Uh, and people died due to that collapse, although not very many, luckily. And then uh, life basically was the, disrupted in that region because this was a very important Bridge. It was over and it was it was connected an interstate highway, so a lot of uh, traffic, business and just personal traffic went over the bridge. So when it became unavailable, people who say lived on one side of the bridge and worked on the other side had to take much longer paths. Uh, 
the interstate highway was disconnected until the bridge was replaced and so on. So it has major consequences. Uh, lives were lost and also there was significant economic disruption. So the thing is, bridges, of course, we expect them to collapse once in a while, just as we expect uh, um, airliners to crash once in a while. There is some non-zero probability of an airliner crashing or a bridge collapsing. Of course, we hope that doesn't happen often, but that's part of the cost of using these technologies. However, this collapse, you know, in the, in the case of bridges, we build them, make sure that they're reliable at the outset, and then they usually have a useful life. And then before they get too uh, unreliable, we simply stop using them and replace them with new bridges to help to avoid uh, such incidents. Well, you may say, well, how do we know that the bridge is about to collapse? Well, in the case of this bridge, we knew it collapsed in 2007 as early as 1990, 17 years prior to its collapse. Experts inspecting this bridge had warned that it was structurally deficient, meaning that it was in danger of collapsing. Okay, that was basically nothing was done for that except uh, increasing the inspection frequency, which obviously did not stop uh, the disaster from happening. Then in 2001, six years before the bridges collapsed, again, a team of engineers declared the bridge structurally deficient. Uh, It had developed fatigue in its various parts. Um, and again, they simply uh, improved the inspection plan rather than doing something about it. The right thing would have been to just say, let's stop using this bridge or let's start be building a new parallel bridge. Uh, say it takes a year or two under normal conditions. And then once the new bridge uh, is available and can be used, just just demolish this bridge. They didn't do that. They continued using the bridge. Uh, they continued spending money on uh, what was really cosmetic improvements, road repairs, uh, adding lights, and doing something to the joints, etc., which obviously wasn't enough. So there were plenty of warnings that this bridge could collapse. So it was a case of Basically, uh, people not doing their jobs, people who were in charge of safety of that bridge not doing their jobs. So one of the things that I emphasize in my course on dependable computing is that we as experts have a moral responsibility to stay informed about the status of systems, and sort of speak up when something uh, we see something that is wrong and has the potential of creating dangers, uh, dangers whether to, to life or to the danger of causing serious economic harm and so on. We have to speak up. And that's part of the moral responsibility of a design engineer to bring these matters to the attention of uh, higher ups. And if they don't listen, if they don't uh, follow the technical advice, then to go and inform the general public of potential problems. And this is known as whistleblowing. Whistleblowing is a valuable job. Okay, uh, this is the Titanic, uh, the ship that was built with a lot of uh, fanfare. It was sort of labeled as unsinkable. And this unsinkable ship actually sunk 
during its first ocean trip. And the story has been well documented and you can read about it, why it sank, what were the problems and so on. This is a high-speed train uh, that wasn't in use yet for passengers. This is a test track on which they were testing this high-speed train in Germany. And this train actually crashed into some barriers on the test track, uh, killing 23 people. And those 23 people were basically engineers and some observers that were taking a test ride on this train. Imagine if this had happened after the train went into operation and there were many hundreds of passengers, the outcome would have been even more disastrous. So basically, when you build a high-speed train, you can't assume that everything will be fine and that the train will be operating normally. You have to think of uh, abuse, uh, user errors, sabotage, terrorism, and so on. All of these have to be taken into account in assessing the risk of using such a system. Okay, I'm going to skip a lot of slides in the rest of this part of the presentation. On this slide, examples of design flaws in computer systems, including a hardware example, a software example, and a user interface example. These are all very interesting stories, and I urge you to spend some time following up to see what they were and what kind of harm they caused. On this slide, you see causes of human errors. Human errors uh, are actually a major cause of problems in computer systems. And therefore, much time has been spent uh, trying to assess you know, the severity of human errors, the frequency and so on. And in this slide, you see some of the causes of human errors and the percentage assigned to them uh, in all the cases that have been observed. So you see personal factors is the main cause, counting for more than a third of human errors. And personal factors include lack of skill in operating the system, lack of interest or motivation, fatigue, a poor memory, uh, age of the operator, or disability. Okay, when something goes wrong uh, in a system, we often get messages from the system that tell us something went wrong. And these messages have to be clear unambiguous and helpful. In other words, they have to tell you exactly what happens and be helpful in the sense of guiding you uh, on what to do about it. Now, this is a place where we need much improvement. So sometimes you run a program and it comes back and tells you fatal error without uh, specifying exactly what went wrong and what you can do about it. It's not specific, it's not unambiguous, and it's not helpful. It's very important that messages coming from the system with regard to things that have gone wrong be clear, unambiguous, and helpful. Uh, user interfaces are basically one of the major causes of problems and errors. And these are some properties of a good user interface that I let you read on your own. It's a checklist, basically. If you ever design a user interface, you have to consult this list to make sure that you have followed the uh, advice, the recommendations.
there is this forum called Risks Digest, uh, moderated by Peter G. Neumann, and the website is given on this slide. I highly recommend that you consult this Risk Digest periodically. Uh, go to that website, they have a newsletter you can subscribe to the newsletter so that you, they, they will send you uh, occasional uh, emails with news stories posted to the forum and the forum consists of stories that people contribute about things that went wrong and it's not only um, things that went wrong in computer systems but generally uh, technology in general okay and technology, of course, is nowadays indistinguishable from computer technology because computers appear everywhere inside all other technological systems. And this particular example you see on this slide is a very, there's a very important lesson. It was about, it's about the nuclear reactor in the U.S. that almost experienced meltdown. Meltdown is what happened in Chernobyl in the former Soviet Union uh, where a nuclear reactor melted down. Uh, there was deadly level of radiation. The area had to be evacuated and it's still not, people are still not allowed in that area because of the dangers of radiation. This almost happened in the U.S. We got lucky that it didn't actually happen. So what happened there was that this nuclear, nuclear reactors have control systems, computerized control systems, that have safety uh, provisions. So if something happens that is fishy, let's say temperature in a part of the reactor goes too high, uh, pressure builds up, uh, or radiation leak is detected, uh, this, the safety procedures shut down the reactors so that at least nothing more will happen. And then there's also an emergency uh, backup system for power because if power goes out in the area of this reactor, we want to be able to run all these uh, safety systems on backup power. Okay, so each of these were tested individually. The safety system was tested exhaustively and it operated correctly in all the tested cases. And the backup generator was tested under various conditions to see that it will kick in when power goes out. However, the combination of these two apparently was not tested. In other words, what happened when you are on backup power one of these safety issues arises so that the safety system has to operate. Well, you may say, why is the safety system even dependent on what kind of power you have, whether you have regular power or backup power? It turns out that in complex systems, the types of systems that we have nowadays, uh, there are interaction problems that do not show up when you test the various subsystems individually. So even though theoretically the backup power should be just like regular power so that the safety system can use this backup power and operate normally, that's usually not the case. So there may be some aspect of this backup power that is sufficiently different from regular power that sort of, uh, throws off the safety routines and makes them behave a little bit differently. So this is very important. You know, a lot of time the, the problems that arise in modern systems is due to different parts interacting rather than any one part actually failing or malfunctioning. The interaction between these complex subsystems is one of the sources of uh, problems. And I have a lot of examples here. Worst stock market computer failure in the year 2000, 
a few items from the years 2012 and 2013 in the risk risks digest. These are just examples. Of course, I've summarized the item. The details can be found in the archives of the risk digest. Actually, failures are things that benefit us. We learn from failures. According to Henry Petrosky, who is an engineer uh, who studies uh, failures and uh, issues in designs, he has multiple books and he writes columns, so on. Uh, in his book, Success Through Failure, The Paradox of Design, published in 2006, he said this, which is one of my favorite quotes. When a complex system succeeds, that success masks its proximity to failure. Thus, the failure of the Titanic contributed much more to the design of safe ocean liners than would have her success. That is the paradox of engineering and design. So the Titanic could have encountered maybe a smaller iceberg or you know, less damage could have been done to it and it could have survived that particular incident. But we would have never known how close it came to total failure, sinking. Because it actually sank, we studied the problem a lot more carefully and discovered in great detail what went wrong, what, what was wrong in the design that led to that disaster on its uh, first voyage across the ocean. Similarly, bridge collapses, high-speed train accidents, and so on, each of them teaches us something about how to do things better in subsequent projects. Okay, this page has a few questions that I ask you to please answer in an email. You can do it in the body of the email. You don't need to attach anything. Just answer these questions and email me the answers. This is for me to learn a little bit about you uh, outside what I know uh, from the class list. I know your name. I, I know a little bit about your major and so on. So this gives me a little bit more idea about if you have an advisor, who he or she is and so on. Uh, what is your GPA? And in fact, one of the things that is quite important given our mode of operation in remote teaching is for me to have a, sort of an idea about how you look so that if I run into you on campus or uh, elsewhere, I recognize you as my student. And this is not happening because we don't have classes. So either on Gaucho space, if you don't have a picture, please put up a picture in your profile there, or just email me a photo with the answers to these questions, whichever is easier for you, so that uh, I have an idea of uh, how you look. Okay, so that was sort of chapter zero. Uh, some general ideas about what the course is about, what the field of dependable computing is about. So this is chapter one in the textbook, uh, background and motivation. I keep checking here to make sure that recording is continuing because I previously recorded or thought I had recorded this lecture almost to the end and I noticed that recording had stopped after a few minutes, after seven minutes. So I'm basically repeating uh, most parts of this lecture in this new video. That's why I keep checking to make sure that the recording is uh, still continuing. Okay, there are some cartoons for us to break the monotony. Uh, so this is part one of the textbook. 
We are in chapter one, background and motivation. And we'll have three more lectures on this part. Uh, dependability attribute in lecture two, uh, combinational modeling and state space modeling in chapters three and four. These are basically methods that allow us to model the reliability or dependability, other aspects of dependability in a computer system using uh, probabilistic combinational model and using state space models, which are basically uh, various forms of Markov chains. So those are tools that we use throughout the course to assess the dependability of systems that we, uh, we design, talk about. Okay, here are some more examples of uh, problems in computer systems, hardware problems, software problems. Um, interestingly, when I started uh, studying this field, hardware problems were actually very serious because hardware was very expensive so we couldn't afford to put a lot of redundancy in. And hardware tended to be unreliable under conditions that were not predictable or not predicted well enough. So a good part of the field dealt with hardware problems. But hardware was easy in the sense that hardware was not very complex in those days. So you could basically spend a lot of time on hardware, test it rigorously, and be pretty confident that uh, there are no problems in the hardware that you have designed. Software has been complex for ages now. Hardware is catching up. Modern CPUs, for example, have uh, billions of transistors in them. They're very complex, uh, maybe still not as complex as the most complex software systems, but uh, they're really comparable, at least in terms of order of magnitude. So there are a lot of parts in this hardware system. Exhaustive testing is almost impractical. Therefore, we face the same problems nowadays in both hardware and software, the problem of complexity. And this, uh, the two examples that you see at the bottom of the slide, I urge you to read them. Uh, the yellow box um, and both are examples of in retrospect, we can call them silly problems. We laugh at the designers not to have foreseen these problems. But this is pretty common. You know, in hindsight, a lot of things that go wrong could have been fixed very easily if someone actually was paying attention. And therefore, that, that's the lesson for us. We have to really do our job, uh, study the system carefully, consider all the special cases, the so-called edge cases that can arise and can throw off the system. And we are not good designers if we don't anticipate these problems with edge cases. Nevertheless, we still see, and now these examples are from 2004 and 1996, are pretty old, but we still see instances of these silly problems arising in computer systems and causing uh, difficulties. And these are a couple of examples of rise in complexity. Uh, from 1992 to 2002, in a decade, Microsoft Windows rose in complexity from 4 million lines of code to 40 million lines of code. And it's even higher these days. The Intel Pentium processor rose in complexity from 4 million for the original version to 40 million for Pentium 4 and to 500 million transistors for a successor, a Titanium 2 processor. So you see that hardware is also increasing, 
increases in complexity over the years. This is one of the major challenges in designing dependable systems. In fact, one of the surest techniques to make systems de dependable is to make them simple, make them as simple as possible, as few features as possible. Don't add features unless they are absolutely needed for proper functioning of the system. The simpler the system, the more likely it is that you can make it de dependable and ensure and test its dependability. So what is failure? At a very high level, failure is defined as an unacceptable difference between expected and observed performance. Sometimes we use the word behavior instead of performance. So between expected and observed behavior. Now a structure or building uh, such as building or bridge need not collapse catastrophically to be deemed a failure. I'll give you a good example of that. So anytime it is not performing its function as expected, as specified, then it has failed. So failure is not always uh, uh, an extreme event such, such as the system exploding or crashing completely can be running smoothly, except that it produces the number four as the answer instead of the correct answer two. No, it didn't crash, it didn't burn, it just spitted out the answer four instead of two, which is a failure. Okay, so how do we avoid failures in systems? Well, in structural engineering, there is this very commonly used technique called safety factor that we use. When we build a bridge, we do calculations to see how thick those bars and beams should be. Uh, in order to be able to bear the expected load on the bridge. When we do the calculations and come up, for example, with a beam that has a cross section of, say, five square inches, we just say, okay, five square inches is enough according to these calculations. Let's make it 20 square inches. So a safety factor of four is introduced. And the reason we need the safety factor is that we are unsure about the strength of these material because they can have hidden imperfections or defects. That's one aspect. We are not sure that we have considered all the different loads and forces that will affect this bridge. Uh, for example, have we considered the strongest winds? Have we considered the uh, the worst earthquake that can arise in this region, uh, the biggest truck that can cross the bridge. Of course, uh, in the case of bridges, it's common to put a sign in front of it uh, to prevent trucks, for example, that are heavier than five tons to cross this bridge. But there's nobody there to enforce this, and it, it is possible that the bigger truck, heavier truck, actually crosses the bridge. And of course, we can say, well, that's the driver's fault uh, because the driver knew that this bridge is not designed for a big truck. But we really don't want to punish people who violate these regulations with death. You know, we sort of provide additional strength in the system to be able to tolerate these abuses that may arise. So unfortunately, in computer systems, we do not have a corresponding uh, you know, we can't just say, OK, I wrote this program. It has 1,000 lines of code. Let me throw in 3,000 additional lines to make it stronger, to make it less likely to fail. That doesn't work. 
actually putting more lines of code is likely to make it less reliable. So we have different techniques, but the idea is the same. We have redundancy. We introduce redundancy into our system so that redundant resources allow us to tolerate some things that can go wrong. Okay, so the picture you see at the bottom right of the slide is an example of a subtle failure. This is the Disney Concert Hall in Los Angeles. It opened with big fanfare. Uh, it's architecturally very interesting and uh, depending on your taste in architecture, you know, you can say it's a very good looking building. Some people you know, say it's uh, monstrous, it's not really that interesting. But uh, taste aside, this building was built and pretty much did the function it was designed to do, much of it anyway. It provided a space for concerts and other facilities for uh, different kinds of arts endeavors uh, project. However, when it actually opened, uh, occupants of, of an office building across the street started getting reflections of sunlight through the curved shiny surfaces of this building. The sunshine was reflected into their buildings, raising the temperature by a few degrees uh, to the extent that it became uncomfortable uh, for them to work in that office building. So this is a kind of failure that I said, you know, it's not catastrophic. But the architects and engineers who built this building should have predicted that these shiny surfaces would reflect sunlight and should have sort of foreseen in which direction they reflect and whether it can cause inconvenience for people living in those areas. So that's an example of the types of failures that I talked about earlier. So you can say this was a failed building project in that sense because it created uh, problems. Okay, why is dependability a concern? <coughs> As I said, you know, systems are growing in complexity. And I will justify this equation later uh, in the next lecture. The reliability of a system over time t is given by this exponential function, e to the minus n lambda t. t is the time the system operates. n is the number of elements or components and lambda is the failure rate of each of those components. I'm assuming n identical components, each of which has a failure rate lambda. For example, lambda can be 10 to the minus 9 per hour. It's usually a small number. Each component fails with probability 10 to the minus 9 over one hour. So lambda is a small number. T is basically how long the system is supposed to run and n is the number of components. So if I want to make this system more reliable, increase R of t, there are only three parameters that I can play with. Reduce lambda, reduce n, reduce t. But there are limits within which I can play with these parameters. So t. If the system is supposed to operate for 10 days without maintenance, then I can't do much about it. If my computer is put on a spacecraft that is going to be in space for one year before it reaches its destination, it needs to operate reliably for that one year so that it's still functional when it gets to the destination and tries to do maneuvers or other things at the destination. Of course, I can reduce t by 
sort of doing what is known as periodic maintenance. So if this system is supposed to run for a year, after each month, maybe, I do a complete test of the system. I uh, preemptively replace some of the components that I think might be getting old. And this is routinely done on airplanes, by the way. So an airplane has various parts uh, in its uh, body, the engines, and these parts are actually replaced periodically before they actually fail in order to reduce this parameter t. Reduce n. Okay, this is basically one of the maxims of dependable computing. Make the system as simple as possible. Use as few components, as few parts, as few features as possible. But of course, you can't reduce n uh, beyond a certain point. You need a certain number of transistors or gates to build a processor, okay? You can work hard in reducing that, but you can't go below a certain minimum number. So simpler systems tend to be more reliable. Reduce lambda, reduce the failure rate. In other words, use components that are more reliable. Uh, I may have components that have lambda equal to 10 to the minus 9 per hour. If there exist components with lambda equal to 10 to the minus 10 per hour, much more reliable, and use them. Uh, the downside is that such more reliable components are often extremely expensive, way more expensive. So, you know, you, your project may not be able to afford. So basically, parts manufacturer actually sell parts of different reliabilities. You can get typical parts pretty cheap, but those highly reliable parts that have undergone a lot more testing, they've gone through special manufacturing processes, they're made way more expensive. Of course, if you are working at NASA and you want to build a couple of computers for spacecraft, you may be able to afford those more expensive parts. But if you're working at the cell phone manufacturer that wants to build millions of cell phones, then those expensive parts will raise the price of the cell phone and therefore may not be approved for use if it if they make the cell phone twice as expensive compared to what the competitors offer. Okay, so as long as the reliability equation is as shown there, these are my only three options. The alternative that we pursue in this course is to change the reliability formula altogether by introducing redundancy. So notice that this equation is based on a non-redundant system, in other words, all n components must be functional over time t in order for the system to remain functional. If I build the system so that it has redundancy, so that you know there are 10,000 components in it, but only 9,000 of them are required for the system to function, then the reliability equation changes, and that's basically one of the main techniques that we use uh, for designing dependable systems. So here you see the curve of reliability according to that equation. NT is on the horizontal axis. Lambda is taken to be a constant 10 to the minus 9. So as NT changes, the reliability changes according to this curve. When NT is fairly small, reliability is high. As NT increases uh, beyond a certain point, reliability nosedives. So reliability at point 0.3679 is useless. Therefore, we don't want to run this system up to NT equal to 10 to the 9. So if n is equal to 10 to the 9, you don't want to 
run it for one hour. Okay, if n is 10 to the 8, you don't want to run it for 10 hours and so on. And reliability 0 0.9048 is maybe acceptable if you are sending a sp an unmanned spacecraft to Mars. Uh, the success probability of 0.9 may be acceptable. In other words, with 10% probability it doesn't succeed and you lose your time and investment in that spacecraft. But if this is a manned, you know, pretty soon we'll be sending astronauts to Mars and the reliability or success probability cannot be 0.9 in that case. It has to be much higher. Okay, so if suppose I'm aiming for a reliability 0.999, this level of reliability. That means n times t should be 10 to the 6. Okay, n is measured in units, components, t in hours. And lambda, remember I said, is 10 to the minus 9. Okay, so this means if I have 1 million components, n equal to 10 to the 6, then one hour is the maximum amount of time I can run the system if the reliability is expected to be this. Okay, if I have, let's say, 10 million components, then T should be 0.1 at most, 0.1 hour. If I make the system simpler so that it has only 10,000 components, then it can run for 100 hours before reliability goes below 0.999, okay? So the simpler I make the system, the better it is from a reliability viewpoint. Okay, so if that equation is what we have, e to the minus n lambda t, then if we want to ensure reliability, you need some other measures. You need to uh, have special design techniques for introducing redundancy. So here, for example, it says, suppose lambda is 10 to the minus 9. Uh, the onboard computer of a 10-year unmanned space mission. So 10 years, if you convert it to hours, is a certain number. And that means that the number of transistors in this computer can be no more than about a thousand or a few thousand if the mission is to have a 90% success probability. Of course, there isn't much you can do with a thousand transistors, therefore you're forced to use other techniques. Uh, the safety argument goes like this. Suppose you have an airline company that has thousands of planes. Each plane has hundreds of flights per year and the probability of a computer failure in a 10-hour flight is about 1%. And not every computer failure is catastrophic. Suppose 0.1% of computer failures result in a crash. These are just, you know, made-up numbers, but they're not far from reality. Each crash causes hundreds of deaths, and for each death, the airline company should pay about, that's the going rate, about $10 million to the survivors of each victim of the crash. And this amounts to billions of dollars per year. So the airline should budget billions of dollars to pay off these damages to families of crash victims. Okay, so the other side of this is that the airline is, will prefer to spend billions to make these computers more reliable, experience fewer failures during a 10-hour flight, because then the budget will be, the required budget for these compensations would be much lower. 
And then we have the availability argument for doing something about our designs to increase their dependability. Uh, a central phone facility's downtime should not exceed a few minutes per year. Central phone facilities basically things like uh, the central switching centers of companies like AT&T, Verizon, big phone companies. Economically, and from the viewpoint of reputation, they cannot afford to have more than a few minutes of downtime per year. Okay, mean time to failure, we will establish later, for such a system with this reliability equation is 1 divided by n lambda. So from this figure here, we can compute uh, the mean time to failure, assuming that we need 20 to 30 minutes for a diagnosis and repair. And that leads us to the conclusion that this central switching facilities of the big phone company cannot have more than about 10 to the 4 transistors in it, which is way, way under what we need to have in such a huge a switching center. Okay, so all these three arguments point to the need for doing something to change this equation because if this equation, exponential reliability equation, rules, then we are stuck. We can't send uh, spacecraft on long space missions, uh, safety will be compromised. Now, safety, of course, is in terms of human lives, but from the uh, sort of selfish view of this airline company, safety is equated with a certain amount of money that they have to pay. And the availability of uh, critical systems such as uh, phone company switching centers also dictates that we change that equation. Okay, I'm going to skip this one, skip this one. Okay, so let's look at a case study in which uh, we have users and we have files that they need to access in a distributed system. So this, this is highly simplified, but it will do for uh, the types of things that we want to do. So suppose a user at this site 1 wants to access a file in this site 3. And let's assume that we access that file through this direct link between the site. In other words, the user sitting here will have access to this file if and only if this link is operational and this site is operational. So I'm simplifying because I'm assuming that if this link is not operational, then perhaps the user can access that file indirectly through site zero. I'm going to ignore that to make things simple, okay? So let's say the link availability is L. And the site availability is S. So S times L. The site available, the link available, assuming independence of failures, is the single copy availability. If S is 0.99 and L is 0.95, then the unavailability of the data to this user will be around 6%. So 6% of the time, the user cannot get the data he or she needs, which means 94% of the time, data is available. So availability is 94%. Unavailability is around 6%. So what do we do about this? 6% is a high unavailability rate. We can duplicate the files. In other words, the file will have a copy here and a copy here. We can triplicate the file with redundancy. And we have a third method that we will discuss. So here's duplication. So each file has a home site and it has a mirror site. 
with the file escaped, an identical copy of the file escape. And of course, that, that copy has to be really identical. So if this file changes, that change should be reflected in the mirror side. And that creates a whole bunch of challenges that we are not dealing with in this simple example. So we assume that the mirror site is magically updated every time the home site is updated. So the user can now get to the data of interest either through link L6 and site S3 or through link L0 and site S0. And this is the availability equation. Okay, the file is available if the primary site is accessible or if the primary site is not accessible, 1 minus SL, but the secondary or mirror site is. So this is now the reliability equation. Remember, in the previous example, we needed both this link and this site to be operational, and the availability was low. And now the reliability equation has changed, the availability equation has changed, and this leads to 0.35% with the same numbers that I used in the previous slide. 0.35%, so 99.65% available, which is much better. Okay, so this involves 100% redundancy. For each file, I have an identical copy occupying the same amount of space on a different site. So we went from 94% availability to 99.65% with simplifying assumptions, okay? Now, suppose we triplicate the file. So the user wanting the file can go to the primary or home site or to backup one or to backup two. And this is now the reliability equation. If the primary site is available, then fine. Otherwise, if the primary site is not available and backup one is available, then we are okay. If the primary site and backup site are both unavailable, then the second, the second backup site. And this is the new reliability equation. And this one gives you an unavailability of 0.02%. So this time we went from 94% availability to 99.98% availability, again with simplifying assumption. So the idea here is that we can do something about changing the shape of the reliability, or in this case availability expression, in order to improve the situation. Both of the methods that I discussed entail high redundancy, 100% for duplication and 200% for triplication. So a natural question is that can we do almost as good with less redundancy? And this is where, you know, I make the point that techniques that we use in this course and in dependable computing in general are not all trivial. Of course, duplication can occur to anybody. Triplication, everybody can think of it. Uh, they are simple methods. You know, in a car, you have four tires that are being used and you have one spare tire. That's redundancy. If you want to improve the reliability, maybe you can use two spare tires so that if two have to get two flat tires, you can still continue uh, driving the car. So here is a more sophisticated example that entails less redundancy. So each file is divided into five pieces. I'll show you an example of how this might be done. And in order to reconstruct the file, you need any three of these five pieces. Okay, it's a special type of coding that uh, I'll give you an example of in a minute. Uh, so uh, you divide the file into five pieces. 
and uh, any three of those pieces are sufficient for you to reconstruct the original content of the file. Let's see what happens now. So the user is sitting here. These are the five pieces of the file. Well, one piece of, of those five pieces is right here on the side. So if the user is using the site, presumably the site is available and therefore piece one can be accessed. So the user needs two of the remaining four pieces in order to reconstruct the file. Okay, and this is the shape of the reliability equation. Of those four pieces, if all four are available, then obviously that's more than enough. If three pieces are available, and one piece is not available, and that can happen in four different ways, depending on which of the four pieces is not available, you're still okay. If two pieces are available, and two pieces are not available, and that can happen in six different ways, four choose two, okay? So this is the reliability equation, the availability equation. And if you plug in these numbers, into this equation, you get an availability of 0.08%. What is the redundancy? It turns out that the redundancy is only 67% in this case. Okay, so non-redundant, 0% redundancy, you got 6% on availability, duplication, 0.35% with 100% redundancy, triplication, 0.02%, with 200% redundancy. In this scheme, 0.08%, uh, not quite as good as triplication, but definitely better than duplication, with 67% redundancy. Okay, of course, this is just an example. You can reduce the redundancy even below 67% and still get reasonable availability. So where does that number 67% come from, okay? Let me show you just one way of doing it. Suppose the file that you are trying to encode consists of just three numbers, A, B, and C. Okay, three 32-bit numbers. This is a highly simplified example. Okay, so uh, the file has three numbers. You use those three numbers as coefficient of the second degree polynomial, ax squared plus bx plus c, and evaluate that polynomial for x equal to 0, x equal to 1, x equal to 2, x equal to 3, and x equal to 4. You get five numbers. So the original file with three numbers is represented as this file with five numbers. So that's where 67% redundancy comes from. So these are five points, any three of which would be sufficient to reconstruct the numbers A, B, and C. So here are, for example, F of 1 has this value, F of 3 has this value, F of 4 has this value. If you fit a second degree curve through the three points, and there's a unique such curve that goes through all three of those points, and that curve will give you the numbers A, B, and C. Okay, if you have only two of these points, let's say F of 3 and F of 4, they are inadequate to reconstruct A, B, and C because many different curves, these dotted lines can go through those two points. And in fact, this method was developed originally by Michael Robin, a computer science researcher for secret sharing. So for example, if you have uh, the combination to a bank safe and you have five managers in that bank and you want to arrange uh, the situation so that you need at least three of those managers to cooperate in order to be able to open the safe. Okay, you want to guard against fraud. You don't want a single manager to be able to do that or even two managers uh, collude to take money and run. 
you need at least three managers. So this is the way you would do it. So this is the combination. You give these five numbers to the five managers, and three of them can get together using the numbers, the information that they have, reconstruct the combination and open the safe. Okay, so it was a basically computer security uh, trick or method. Okay, let me skip this. So impairments to dependability have variously been described by words such as fault, bug, defect, malfunction, crash, failure, and so on. And these words have been used historically haphazardly uh, with no well-known uh, definition of each or distinction between what's different between a fault and a bug, a bug and a defect, and so on. So one of the things I've done in my multi-level view of dependable computing and uh, the textbook that I've written is to give these terms precise meanings and be able to use them in a more or less precise manner to describe events that occur in a computer system. I'm going to skip these background slides and go directly to this model that I've developed over the years for dependable computing. It's a seven level model that says a system is hopefully ideal, it doesn't have any problems, it runs perfectly and everything in it is okay. Uh, this is uh, wishy-washy for modern systems. Modern systems will have some latent problems, built-in problems that may not always be visible, but they are there. A system, the device level, can have defects. These devices can have defects, and the system is called defective at that level. At the logic level, we can have fault, logic faults and the system may be faulty. At the system state level, it can, there can be errors. We call the system erroneous. At the system or architecture level, various components or subsystems can be malfunctioning. At the service level, the service of the system can be degraded, can be less than ideal. And finally, at the result level, the system fails. Now the model postulates that we move downwards through this model as things go wrong until eventually we get to the failed state. So these are basically things that can, can happen over time due to the system wearing, uh, wear out of the system or some intruder doing something to the system to make it go downward. But we also have these upward transitions that we build into the system. So when the system becomes faulty, we can detect and remove the fault and move it upwards, further away from failure. When a system starts, the starting state can be any of these, which is kind of weird. You would think that the system should start in the ideal state and then later go. That's not true. There have been examples of systems that have started in the fail state. In other words, they never actually ran as expected. They were failed to begin with. So the system can start in any of these states. And then it can sort of remain in these states. So it may be defective. That defect really doesn't take it further down and make it faulty. For example, we may have built-in defect tolerance methods, and those defect tolerance methods allow the system to remain in the defective state without going further down. So these are basically tolerance methods. These are undesirable events, the downward transition, and these are desirable effects or remedies that we built into the system in order to move it back up towards the ideal state, if not completely to ideal, at least further away from failure. Of course, it's a simplified feature of this model that we say, 
a defective system can become faulty. In practice, it's possible for a defective state to go directly into the failed state. Something happens that that defect basically creates a problem that the system fails. Those are possible, but much less likely if we have designed the system according to some design principles. So defects generate faults and they don't go directly into the failed state. So this is the model on which the structure of my textbook is based. Uh, so basically, I have a part dealing with defects. I have a part dealing with faults and errors, malfunctions, degradations, and failures. And there's a part at the beginning that is the introduction. So those are the seven parts, seven parts of the my textbook or my view of the field of dependable computing. So here is a, a nice analogy. These seven models can be viewed as concentric reservoirs. So this is the innermost is the defect level, then the fault, error, malfunction, degradation, failure. And water flowing into these tanks, reservoirs, is basically the undesirable events that are occurring. If we let water flow into, say, the defect, there, there are more and more defects then eventually this level will overflow, and then eventually this level will overflow, and then water will go out, and that constitutes failure. The entire system has failed. So we can reduce the flow of water. This is an analogy. Closing inlet valves represents avoidance techniques. We have a bunch of techniques to avoid defects, avoid fault, avoid errors, avoid malfunctions, avoid degradations, and avoid failures. So if we close these valves, then either water will not flow in or will flow at a slower pace, therefore extending the system life. Oops. A tolerance techniques correspond and this analogy to these drain valves. We can have a lot of defects, but if we have defect tolerance, in other words, we drain water from that innermost tank at a high enough rate, then water perhaps does not get into the next tank and so on. So I think this is a nice analogy that says, as long as you have a bunch of avoidance techniques to restrict the flow of water into these tanks, you have a bunch of tolerance techniques that re to remove water at a high enough rate. Water will never overflow into the outside world and therefore causing system failure. Uh, dependable computer systems are uh, categorized into three classes, long life systems, these are typically the systems that you put on spacecraft. They have to live for a long life without maintenance. These are known as high reliability systems or fail slow systems or rugged systems. Uh, for safety critical applications, we need systems that are fail safe. In other words, they either don't fail or if they fail, they fail in a safe mode so that they don't endanger human lives or other, cause other serious problems. These are high integrity systems. And finally, non-stop systems. These are high availability systems. These are the systems that, for example, e-commerce site, places like Amazon and uh, eBay use because if their system becomes unavailable, even for a few minutes, they lose a lot of revenue. 
certificates and millions of dollars for each minute of unavailability. So these are basically high availability, robust or fail soft system. So parts of the system can fail, you know, a few servers here and there can fail uh, at Google or in Amazon, but the system is built so that that does not have a big impact on the overall system operation. Okay, so I'll stop at this point. Uh, next time, next lecture, we'll talk about dependability attributes, chapter four. Okay, bye-bye and stay safe.